our contributions in education will be our legacy in this industry. Whether it's through live education or maybe through social media, we're always trying to make a personal connection with you, the learner. At FanVia, we believe our smile is our business card and our personality is our logo. And how we make people feel after you experience our education and tools is our trade. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us, my friends, and be a part of the Sandia community. What's up, everybody? It's Andrew Brothers, Education Director for Sandia. And look, this dude over here, he's one of the co-founders of the company, Kurt <laughs> Gerheim. I, I, I barged into another one of our shows. <laughs> <laughs> we love having you on, dude. It's been fun to have a, a new kind of co-host on these. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a blast too, guys. I, you know, this is so much fun. Our heart is in education. So to be in the middle of it is really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And actually, Kurt used to be on radio. So this is like close to his heart too, to be able to be a presenter and to be able to talk. If you listen, yeah. you totally hear his radio voice kick in as he's talking. And you can tell I have a face made for radio. All right. Hey, Andrew, what a month. This is what I wanted to bring up right away is this is our first real class in the month of October. And we have a blast full of things to do this month. It's going to be a great month of education and also for our promotions that we have running this month. Let me quickly give you a peek, everyone, what opportunities there are for you this year, uh, this month. And there are several. We've been telling you and now available are our Midnight Blue Special Limited Edition irons and blow dryer. We also got a, our monthly promotions that are running. Plus, we have a special Mega October giveaway. There's so much here this month, guys, that I'm just going to suggest that you keep uh, stay close to us on our website. Also, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe so that you're made aware of everything that's going on. And you're going to have a wonderful month with Sam Via for certain. And th that's just the beginning, Andrew, because the education is rocking this month. Yeah, for sure. We've got a good lineup, of course. we got Mannequin Monday today with me. <laughs> there is. But tomorrow we've got our good friend Manda Ziegelman. She's going to come and teach us some rock and roll hair. This girl is kind of the master at those mullety shags that we're seeing all over Instagram. So we're super stoked to have her. She's a blast. My good buddy, um, <laughs> Steve Gomez, can't say enough about this dude. He's going to bring to us some certain leadership team, uh, certain leadership tips for these uncertain times. Even if you're not a salon owner, I'd highly, highly recommend you tune into this. He's just got so much to offer. And then for those of you that might be tuning in from one of our partner hair schools, we've got our skills up training coming on October 8th that um, we're going to be talking about the Bob story. And this is something that we do exclusively for our partner schools. And if you are interested in being a guest to check that out, if you're a school owner, you can um, contact Kurt, the gentleman you saw earlier, Kurt at Sambia.com, and maybe he can get you on the guest list to get a sneak peek. But you have to be associated with the schools, okay? So. Yeah, we, we'd love to have anybody who's interested, who's affiliated with the school, come see us on Thursday. It's a great class taught by Sam and Andrew. So, mm -hmm. Andrew, let's rock and roll Monday, shall we? Yeah, I'll rock and roll Monday. This. See how I led to tomorrow. The rock and roll Monday, that's tomorrow's Transformation Tuesday. <laughs> Everyone, he really does play that. He actually does play that. <laughs> it's, just not, it's not just background. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great right, show, dude. Andrew. Thank you. Hey, I just want to check in and say hello to some people because we've got lots of people checking in from all over the world. We've got our buddy Sonia. She's on all the time with us. How you doing, Sonia? And Sonia and Kiran from Pakistan. Um, we've got Svetlana in the house from North Dakota, which, man, I, it's probably starting to get cold up there, I'd imagine. <laughs> Ignacia from New York's in the house. Shannon from Colorado. Nancy from Atlanta. 
Oh man, we've got Tara's in the house as always. We love you, Tara. Thanks for always being here. North Carolina looks like, yeah, we got to talk about some stuff if you're putting on wrist braces to go to work. Asia, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Tara's saying, play something for us. <laughs> oh man, we got Sri Lanka in the house. We've got UK. I mean, just this is what's so cool. Hey, Corey, how you doing, homie? Um, but this is what's so cool about these Manic and Mondays and Transformation Tuesdays. Guys, just know that if you're here watching, you are you are in a community worldwide at this point. The, the whole globe is watching with you. So very cool, huh? All right. So the topic for today is ergonomics. I know that this isn't the most exciting topic on the planet because we're not going to necessarily teach you a haircut. We're not going to teach you techniques with cutting hair. We are going to focus on what we feel is actually almost the most important thing you need to learn as a hairdresser. And it's how to take care of your body. How do we know that this is important? Because very few people make it past about 15 years to 20 years in this industry without significant challenges in their body, especially shoulders, wrists, elbows, neck, low back, you name it. Hairdressers are in pain somehow. In fact, there was um, a lady that we were talking with. Uh, she was doing a research paper based on uh, the challenges with hairdressers. So big topic today is such an important one. We are going to be completely holistic with this. We are going to start by talking about our feet, our legs, our hips. We're going to go up into the shoulders, the elbows, the wrists, everything, so that you can have a really long career at the chair. So let's start first with talking about feet because this is something that we recognize gets kind of forgotten about pretty often. So <clears throat> if you're willing to play along with me, say yes in the chat. If you're willing to play along today, type yes in the chat. I'll have some coffee while you do that. There's a little bit of a delay, so I'm sure you're, I hope you're writing yes. Oh, there we go. It's flooding in. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you are in a place that you can stand up, raise your bum out of the seat and put put your feet on the floor. And especially if you can not have shoes on right now, if you're not at work or something, or if you can kick your uh, shoes off, just feel your feet for a moment. And this is my good friend, Sean Float, who's a incredible physical therapist, yoga teacher. He's the one who really taught me about this. Within your feet, just feel if you are balanced standing on your feet. The way you know is there should be equal pressure. Let's say this is the bottom of your foot. There should be equal pressure from the big toe to the back. Um, so let's call this the, the front well, I guess we can't call it the front right corner, but from your big toe to the back corner of the heel, and then from the pinky toe all the way to the opposite back corner, there should be kind of an X there. So just kind of feel for a second, are you standing equal on your feet? Or like I was doing for a long time, I would find myself actually standing on the corners of my feet. They weren't flat on the floor. I would actually kind of rock myself out onto the edges of my feet and put all of this pressure through my hips and through my knees. Really horrible. And I, I mean, who knows where we get these bad habits from, but I had it. So it's super important to check in with that. And this is great. Yeah, Simone, get out in the yard and put your feet into the grass, right? So put your feet on the floor and feel that balance in, in the, um, in the feet. When you do, just kind of sink down into those feet, feel that nice grounded and let the weight of the body kind of sink and soften down into your feet. And just feel how supportive your feet can actually be for you if they are fully planted. You can actually kind of like move around now, but like move from your feet. Don't move your hips right now. Just kind of like 
push your body around from your feet. Notice that you can get this great grounded sensation just by keeping the feet nice and flat with the floor and keeping that even balance on, on your feet. All right, so <clears throat> that's the first thing that we would recommend that you would check in on before you start your day. Just get that balance in the feet. Now, the second part is to remember that your feet have to move as you do hair. Hair is a holistic movement. So one of the things that I really loved that we taught at Paul Mitchell Hair Schools was that over direction in your haircut comes from your feet, which I always thought was kind of confusing until it, it started to click. So what we talk about with over direction in a haircut is movement of hair forward or back, right? So if I say I want my haircut to fall forward, what we do is we over direct hair back and away from the face to do that, right? So what ends up happening to many, many hairdressers, and I'll include myself in that, uh, is that we tend to get our feet stuck on the floor, specifically behind that chair. So um, if Lydia, this is Lydia, named after mom's beautiful mom, or uh, Sam's beautiful mom. If Lydia is my client and she's sitting in my chair, a lot of times we just get the client facing the, the mirror and then we get stuck back here. So to over direct the hair back, very often what we do is this. We reach around the head. So am I on my feet right now? No, I'm on my toes. I'm way out of balance here. So make it more natural, make it more human. Humans are meant to walk. So the lower body controls over direction. So if I'm trying to, let's just use the, like a really extreme example here. If I want to over direct the front air, all the way to the center back. Let's say I'm really looking for that like super 90s eight line kind of haircut. <laughs> if I walk to the front and pick up the section, look what happens as I move my body. Over direction. <gasps> oh my gosh. <sighs> right? So feet control over direction, not this, because this throws us out of balance. If we train ourselves to work to our center, work to our center, work to our center, we don't have to be doing these weird body positions that we sometimes see ourselves in, right? And I know some of you are chuckling because you know that you do this stuff and it's unnecessary. And we'll talk more about hand and wrist position in just a minute, but just really lock into that concept that your feet are your over direction tool within your haircut. So <laughs> Tara's like, nah, I don't do that stuff. Shut up. Yeah, right. Because I still do. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. So even with slight amounts of over direction, all this still works. Let's take, again, just a simple example of cutting like a graduated bob or something where you're over directing back to that previously cut section. If my feet stand in the position where I want the hair to go, this allows me to stay very, very balanced. So as I go to the next section, if my feet stay at the previously cut section, my natural tendency is to draw hair towards me, draw hair towards me, and that helps me to set my over direction. <laughs> Simone says Lydia's layers are falling so pretty. Uh, <laughs> if if I if I dug into this a little bit more, it's this, this poor girl's been chopped up pretty good. <laughs> but I'm glad it looks that way on, on camera. But just place yourself into a position where you can stay balanced on your feet at all times within your haircut. This is not just about feet. What happens from the feet translates all the way up through the body, all the way to the top of your head. So if you want to, just stand up again. Put your feet nice and flat on the floor. Get centered in again. Make sure that balance is all the way across the feet. 
Head over top of the shoulders, shoulders over top of the hips. Pretty straight in your alignment. And you'll notice that like you can kind of relax your body and you don't feel like you're gonna fall over. So now lean forward just enough to put your weight in the pads of your feet up and more in your toes. As soon as you do that, notice all the other muscles that contract within your body to try and keep you stable. Your low back probably just got really tight as you shifted forward. So this is why this is so important. It doesn't just do something for your feet. It doesn't just do something for your haircut. This is what keeps the balance and the structure within the entire body. So super essential. Can't stress that enough. Yes, Svetlana, for sure. Healthy first, safe first. It's got to happen. Yeah, Tara noticed low back starts to tighten. Okay, so let's move up the body. A bit. Let's talk about the, the upper body now. So with the upper body, a lot of how to keep your body safe is going to depend on where you're working on the head. Because there's a lot of discussion if it's better to cut palm to palm, fingers up, fingers down, palm to the head. So um, there's kind of two perspectives here. There's the, um, uh, I don't wanna call it necessarily precision because it's not necessarily precision mindset, but there's sort of the technical mindset. Let's call it the technical mindset, which tells us if I have a vertical section that's straight up and down, the best thing for me to do is to put my body into a vertical position as well to keep my body parallel with that section. This is how I was taught. I started working with Sammy, who is very conscious of ergonomics, and we're working together and he sees me doing this stuff and cutting. And he's kind of like, hey, you know you can drop your shoulder, right? So that it's not so stressful in your body. I'm like, no, 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 Sam. You drop your shoulder and you mess up your section angle accuracy. And he said, okay, so how long do you think that you can work behind the chair doing 40 hours a week doing this? <laughs> and I said, mm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know that that's going to be real sustainable in my body. So was it potentially more accurate? Good morning, Bernadette. I see you. Um, is it more accurate? Maybe. Is it good for your body? Probably not. So you have to make that decision. It's always a, a balancing act of, um, we kind of say that the, for every decision, there's a benefit and there's a compromise to what you're doing, right? So the benefit of dropping the elbow and relaxing the shoulders, of course, is just simply healthier body. The uh, compromise is your accuracy could potentially suffer if you don't learn to um, adjust to that change, which there's plenty of ways to adjust to that change. We had lots and lots of rules at the school too of what hand position you were supposed to be in in relationship to where you were on the head or what type of work you were doing on the head. For example, we would say if you are using graduation as your technique, which is creating short from the bottom to long at the top, that we should always be in a palm out position. So that might be fingers up or it might be fingers down, depending on where we were on the head. We also said if we were in a layering position, then we should always be in palm towards the head or cutting on the outside of the fingers. So again, there is... Um, there's truth there. <laughs> Everything has truth to it. The truth is that consistency within how we move our body will create more consistent haircuts. Again, we have to make a decision if we feel like this is a healthy position for us to continually to be in cutting hair. So most of the time, what we've found is if you are below the transition of the head, if you're below that vertical transition, we find that standing in front of the section and palm towards, towards us tends to be most ergonomically beneficial. So what that means 
is if I'm working below, here, let's section this off, give you an idea. So this is what we call the vertical transition of the head. Some people call it the parietal ridge. But it's that transition vertically on the head from where the head tends to be a more vertical plane to a more of a horizontal plane. <laughs> Holly, uh, shoulder drop. <laughs> Notorious Auckland, 275, New Zealand. Very cool. I was actually in Auckland back in November. It's a beautiful city. Holy cow, it's so pretty there. Okay, so below the vertical transition, in most cases, we find that palm down or palm towards us is going to be most efficient because it allows us to keep our body in, in a naturally relaxed state. Once we start to go overhand, palm towards the head, that tends to elevate the elbow. This could be different depending on exact finger angles. So these aren't rules, these are guides. Because if we start to get into really extreme finger angles, let's say like super short at the top to super long at the bottom, high elevation, then palm down might actually be the best. Because if we're at that angle here, this starts to get pretty awkward, right? So you have to adjust to the specific elevations, the specific finger angles, whether you decide to be here or here. That feels more natural and I can stay more balanced over my feet. But as soon as the elevation drops a little bit, this feels much, much more comfortable, much more balanced. Yeah, Simone, um, so we found out that the parietal, parietal ridge actually does not exist. <laughs> we got super dorky one time and dug into some actual anatomy books and looked at bone structure and we kept saying huh why is there no um description of the parietal ridge and so i asked a doctor and that was my client at the time and he was like the what i've never heard of the parietal ridge and i was like oh okay so parietal ridge actually doesn't exist <laughs> there is a parietal plate parietal is a term but this is the parietal plate is what goes across that center top portion of your head right there, the kind of flatter portion of it across the top of your head. That's the parietal plate. And it does link with the temporal fossa that's right here on the side. And it does have a bit of a ridge to it. So I think that's why we called it the parietal ridge. But we just call it the vertical transition. Uh, let me see, Bernadette, I have been holding my arm and shoulder up and I've been in pain at the end of the day and need to practice along with my arm. Yes. Yeah, so Bernadette, that's, and here's the thing is this stuff, if you already have kind of trained your body into the bad habits of cutting hair like this and cutting hair like this, when we readjust people, it's so crazy. Like when we're in the salon with you guys and doing hands-on, as people start taking their sections and start doing this kind of stuff, and we're like, hey, just try this, just for a moment. Drop your shoulder, hand up, go to this position. They get all weird, like, oh, this feels so uncomfortable. And it's just because it's new, it's different. It's a different way to hold your body. So know too, Bernadette, that as you make these adjustments, it's not going to feel uh, perfectly comfortable right from the beginning. It's gonna take a little bit of time for you to adapt into these new positions and let the body adapt too. And we're, we're gonna talk about hand positions and things like that, but that's why sometimes people have a hard time the first week or two that they buy our shear is because that thumb ring is so far forward. They're used to kind of cramming their thumb way back here. Once they get here and start to relax their body more, it actually feels uncomfortable at first to them. And it's just because we've trained our bodies so well. Mary, yeah, explains why you've been having pains from the shoulders. It's so true, man. Like, I I really, I, I hope this becomes something that we train in schools a little bit more as ergonomics. Maybe, Kurt, that's, that's actually maybe one of our skills up training is coming up too, is talking about ergonomics. Great minds think alike. Yeah, on your radar, <laughs> good. Sweet. So now as we go 
up the vertical transition. And Sonia, I think I, I saw you ask a question, something about like your shorter clients and stuff. <laughs> um, hopefully you have a, a chair that uh, can raise and lower. And for those of you, by the way, because I do know that sometimes the hairdresser might not have a lot of height to work with. I'm very conscious about how I say that, right? Um, if you are someone that does not have a lot of height to work with, there are specific chair bases that you can buy to um, make the chair much lower. We actually had both within the salon. We had a chair that actually sat super low to the ground. It still had hydraulics and stuff in it, but it can actually raise them lower. But also, there are chairs that, for those of you that do have a lot of heights to work with, there are chairs that actually have extended heights too. So um, there's both. You might want to look into that if you're having a hard time. Kenya, you, you, you're kind of, you're getting ahead of me, but we're definitely going to talk about that for sure, for sure. Um, cool. Uh, Lauren, yes, carpal tunnel surgery. So... Um, Carpal tunnel surgery is, that's a tough one too, because I've actually talked to quite a few physical therapists. Um, this is actually relevant to talk about because this is something so common for hairdressers. Before you go into carpal tunnel surgery, have your neck looked at. Because the physical therapist that I worked with in Salt Lake City I told, I went to her because I was like, oh, I'm getting carpal tunnel. Because that's what we always think. We're always like, oh, well, because we use our wrist so much, we're getting carpal tunnel. Because we're using our wrist, we're going to get carpal tunnel. Guess what? She told me that at least 60, 70% of the time, it has nothing to do with the wrist. And it's something in the, the vertebrae and the, the neck, which is exactly what was happening with me. I had pain that was starting from my, my shoulder. It was extending through my shoulder, down through my armpit, through the pit of my elbow, down through my wrist. And it was getting hard to actually close my, my hand. So, of course, I just thought, oh, well, carpal tunnel. What we had to do was, I'm going to give you a profile. Because here's what we do as hairdressers. Right? <laughs> Say yes if you're with me now. We hang our head forward, we kind of push our hips forward, and we get real close to our work. I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. Maybe a little bit. So what happened is by hanging my head forward for so long, it had actually gotten a disc back here to start slipping forward and putting pressure onto the nerves that went down through my neck, through my arm, through my elbow, she she specifically said that when someone comes in complaining of carpal tunnel, her first thing that she works on is actually spine and neck. And she's like, that usually helps. So if you're out there, I'm not saying you don't have carpal tunnel. I'm not definitely not saying that you shouldn't get carpal tunnel surgery if if that's what it seems like is is not happening. All I'd suggest is if you would get diagnosed with carpal tunnel, it would probably be worth the extra step to also do some neck work with a physical therapist. Just a little, just a little FYI. <laughs> Holly, yeah, once you swim, you'll never go back. <laughs> All right, cool. So once we get about that vertical transition, sorry, I got off subject a little bit there. <clears throat> Oh, good question. Very qu good question, Lorinda. So our perspective on this would be absolutely not. That would be totally justifiable. So on how you set things up, right, Lorinda? <clears throat> so if I say, hey, can you stand up to make it more comfortable for me to cut the perimeter of your hair? Uh, you know, that, that could come across as a certain way. Um, but if we said, Lorinda, hey, I want to make sure that I get the bottom edge of this haircut really precise. The best way for me to do that is to cut it in the position that you're normally going to be in. So would you mind standing up for me? That's going to give me a great way to get this bottom just really perfect for you. Um, so notice what we did there. We kind of set it up as a benefit to them to have them standing. 
So a little play on words, but in our opinion, our feeling is that you have to stand behind the chair eight, nine, 10 hours a day. They're only in your chair maybe for 45 minutes to a couple hours at most if they're getting color too. So putting them in a little bit of an awkward position once in a while to save your body, we say totally fine with that. <clears throat> huh, Simone, that's interesting about it being potentially um, hereditary too. Interesting. Venus thoracic outlet syndrome. Well, Lindsay, that is, um, that's a mouthful. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's crazy. I've never even heard that. Tony saying, uh, be graduating this Friday. Congratulations, Tony. That's awesome. Um, felt that ergonomics wasn't the main focus enough. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and here's the thing about school, Tony, is that just kind of like to let you in too, because with schools, they basically have a curriculum that's kind of dictated to them by the state board too. And pretty much within a, you know, if you have a 1500 hour course, it pretty much means that most of those 1500 hours need to be spent fulfilling the expectations of the state board so you can get a license. So that's definitely, I think, why a lot of this kind of stuff doesn't necessarily make it into curriculum all the time. But I, we definitely feel like it, it could be um, amped up, <laughs> if you will. So, and, hey, congratulations on your graduation this Friday. And we wish you the best out there in the hairdressing world, my friend. Oh, yeah, Josie, good, um, good point. If you do have your client stand, two things that we, we found will help, have them stand at the back of the chair and put their hands on the back of the chair. It'll keep them from like shifting back and forth or leaning and doing stuff like that. Just gives them something to balance on and ask them to specifically don't lock your knees. We had the exact same thing happen to us at our Parley's Way location one time. I think it was... Yeah, I think it was my buddy Johnny Katzenavis. He had his client standing, cutting her perimeter, and I heard this. Now looked over, and his client was on the floor. She had fully passed out and hit the floor. So thank you for bringing that up. If you do have your client stand, two things: have them stand at the back of the chair, hold on to the back of the chair. Second, make sure that they don't lock the knees. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Cool. Okay. I still don't think I've actually covered the top of the head. So let's cover that real fast. And then we're going to get on to hand position. Um, so what we found is most of the time when we're working on the top of the head above the vertical transition, that's where hand down tends to come in really handy. There are specific situations that in palm still can be pretty comfortable up here on the top of the head. So Again, like if the elevations may be a little bit lower, that might be more natural to you than being here. So um, again, you kind of have to just play with those positions. Trust your body. Your body is going to tell you the information you need to have. So if it hurts, find a different position. That's the first thing that's going to tell you if you're in the right position or not. Because if it doesn't feel good, it's time to find a different positioning. And you just kind of have to keep working with that. All right, so let's talk about hands because this is huge. So we've talked about keeping our feet nice and balanced. We've talked about choosing a hand positioning so that we're not putting the shoulders up as much. Of course, there's going to be some times that the shoulder is going to come up a little bit. But for the most part, we really encourage you to keep those shoulders down, keep them soft. Keep the shoulders relaxed back. Don't pull them back. Don't. This is another thing that my PT taught me, and he's a great yoga teacher. When we're told, pull your shoulders down and back, don't pull them down and back. That's just creating more tension, and it tends to make us kind of puff out. Relax the shoulders down and back. 
you know, actually feel that even your hips will relax down and back too, if you just allow that space to relax down and back. <clears throat> okay, so hands. Now, I am going to talk a little bit about shears because this is, it's huge. Shears are huge because I was taught on a completely non-offset shear. And so of course my hand adapted to that positioning. So what do we mean by non-offset shear? Sorry, I should have had these out. Let me get two other shears out here for you. So if in the shear world, you've got a couple different options of handle. So um, traditionally, the first shears were made like this. This is non-offset. So um, the finger and the thumb holes are perfectly parallel with each other. And notice that the center of the shear is here. So the pivot of the shear is in the center. This shear, the difference, let me put them next to each other. This shear has a slightly forward or a slightly offset thumb. So this takes the thumb from being parallel and it shifts it forward. The other thing you'll notice about this is that if I look at the center, the thumb is actually a little bit off center. So what a slightly offset shear does versus a non-offset shear is it starts to take our hand from this position with a non-offset shear. Notice how my thumb and, and finger are actually right above each other. And if you look at, come on, focus, there we go. If you look at the natural position of your hand, it's not that, is it? It's that. So we're taking our thumb and our finger and we're putting them in a very, very awkward position in relationship to natural with a non-offset shear. The, ben the one benefit of a non-offset shear is the distance from here to the pivot is longer. So that gives you more leverage to push through the hair. That's the one benefit of a non-offset shear. As we start to offset and start to crane the handle, what it does is it takes our thumb and finger from here, watch my elbow, and it starts to relax the body position. But we want to step further with our design. So let's put these up next to each other. So you'll notice that the thumb on the offset shear is down a little bit. So we went to a forward set. So with our shear, if you look at your natural hand position, as I put the shear in, there's not much adjusting I have to do from natural. Also, look at how tilted the handle is downwards. So what this does is it allows us to keep the elbow down in a much more natural position. You almost can't do this with a non-offset shear. With a straight set shear, to get my hand into this thing, I almost have to lift my elbow because putting the elbow down with that, it hurts. But with our shear, ah, oh, puts your hand into a natural position and really relaxes you. So um, that is, that's why our handle is shaped so differently. Hope that helps. Tommy, what's up, buddy? Yeah, Sonia, definitely. If you're having wrist pain, then what we're talking about today, either with neck, shoulders, elbows, might be the hand position on your shears, all of it can uh, add to that. So um, someone said, once you go swivel, you'll never go back. So, um, I actually personally, just me and myself, I don't prefer the swivel for most of my work. I love it for certain things and certain body positions that it's hard to get into. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But to, for me, just personally, 
I actually really like the solid thumb. I just feel like I have more control over it. I'm gonna show you some hand exercises too that you can get more range of motion, even if you don't have the swivel. But here's where a swivel really comes in handy. Different body positions that you might be in can be really challenging with a solid thumb shear if you don't have the ability to kind of move that solid thumb around. So um, let's take, for example, like just a really nice tight graduation of some sort. This kind of hand position really can be tough to cut that cutting line because what ends up happening is my thumb can't move. I kind of have to go here or I have to go here to cut. So look at my wrist. Look at my elbow, look at my wrist, look at my elbow. There's not much option here to get out of this position. But if you take the thumb, this is our six inch swivel um, from the signature series. If I have my thumb in a swivel shear, I can actually allow the shear to rotate down into that position. So instead of taking my body and moving the shear, I can take the shear, move the shear. Ooh, look at that. Look how natural. No stress in the shoulders, no stress anywhere. And Carrie Joe Rosati, you're exactly right. Another place that this is fantastic is sometimes when we're doing our perimeters down here, we tend to get up like this or we're trying to get like this. Again, here's my horizontal line I'm trying to cut, Carrie Joe. Just take the shear, rotate, sit in a nice natural position. Ooh, nice. Feels good, right? <laughs> um, I noticed a question about which shear. Uh, Antonio, name of that shear you demonstrated with, please. And also, do they come in a single swivel design? Okay, so Antonio, the first year that I was showing you of ours, this is our Streamline series. This is our six and three quarter inch. This one comes in a six and a quarter inch and a five and a half inch. This right now is my favorite just because the handle is so incredibly comfortable. We spend a lot, we spend a lot of time on this handle to make just like the sculpting of the fingers and everything just so really nice. The uh, series that we have uh, swivel option for you is our signature series. So this is the signature series. The difference between the signature and the streamline, they're exact same materials, same bells and whistles, but this the signature series just has a little bit larger uh, finger openings in it. So if you have larger hands or you prefer something that has a little bit more looseness in the hand, then the signature series is great. But that we have a five and a half and a six in the swivel and our big seven inch uh, dry cutting shear too. And looks like we've got the um, link up in the chat for you. <laughs> Tony's saying, ooh, ah, so satisfying. <laughs> totally, I get you, I'm so there with you. Um, <laughs> okay, where was I? Oh, okay, what I wanna show you at this point is how to get better dexterity within your hand. So even if you don't have a swivel, you have a lot more range of motion. So here's the first thing is that we want to get great control over the shear, but we don't want to hold it too tightly. So what we find is a lot of times people will bring the finger all the way in until it gets to the second knuckle and they'll take the thumb and put it, the thumb in until it actually gets to a point that they're both kind of stuck into it. There we go. Oh. So what happens here is if we're completely locked into the shear, it's really hard for us to isolate the thumb. It, it kind of gets really tough on the thumb to get that isolated thumb movement. So we tend to become a quacker, right? Where the fingers and the thumbs move. The more that we can isolate and just allow the thumb to move, the more gentle it is in our body and the more precise we are. So when you pick up your shear, what you wanna do is you actually want to keep the shear more up around the first knuckle and then the thumb 
let me see if I can get this into the camera here for you. The thumb is just kind of gently resting into the thumb hole. The thumb goes in and it just kind of creates a little bit of pressure going uh, vertically up towards the tip of the shear. Because once that connects there, you can fully control without the thumb being stuck into the finger hole. So keeping it more into the fingertips, it allows the thumb to move much, much easier so that you get this. This is the first thing that we would suggest that you practice. You can put the shear on a flat surface, whether it's your fingers or it's your uh, just your knee, but you can do this watching Netflix, which we would totally encourage you to do because the more that you build muscle memory with this, the less you have to think about it to perform it. So just practice this each day, especially for you, Tony, if, if you know, before you get in, get too far out into the, the world of hairdressing, practice this stuff every single day. You turn this into muscle memory so that you can have a long career. Once you have that, then it's all about trying to get this shear in different positions. So um, here's just a horizontal cutting position. But what we want is just like the swivel shear, we want to have more range of motion. So practice with the shear actually tucked back. And again, look, if, was, if I don't get my finger and my thumb too stuck into the holes, it has the ability to move within my hand. So I can actually tuck the shear back and cut very, very relaxed and naturally. Or we can go much more forward. Notice that I didn't change wrist position, just changed hand position. So the wrist stays neutral, but you just change the hand position. Okay. And as, as long as you keep that thumb just kind of softly in the thumb hole, you have that ability to cut in a lot of different positions, almost as much range of motion as you have with a swivel thumb. So with the swivel, definitely can do all those. The one advantage you have with the swivel is now you can actually cross over that point go into other positions. You can actually do this with a solid thumb shear. The challenge is, is that you have to train yourself to do your shear work a little bit differently. So for example, let's go back to that steep graduation point. If you take the thumb out, oh, all the shear to kind of fold forward, put the thumb back in on the opposite side. So watch again, shear goes up straight up, let it wrap forward. Watch my fingers here. See how the fingers kind of curl in towards my palm? So I'm allowing the shear to go downwards. Take the thumb, and you just have to pop it back in the opposite side. Now, if I'm doing more graduation, look at body position versus that. So again, let the shear roll forward, take the thumb, pop it in on the opposite side. Also good for one length. Um, I, I forget your name, uh, some Bobby Joe, or oh, I can't remember, but you brought up the, the perimeter of the bobs. Same thing. We're cutting that one length line. If we keep the thumb on the top, that's when we kind of have to get the elbow up or we have to do this, which means we've got to get low, which this can actually be quite comfortable too if you can get low enough. But the other option is to do the same thing. Take the thumb out. Wow, the shear to rotate forward. Pop the, pop the thumb on the opposite side. Hmm, nice, right? <laughs> Oh, thanks, Sonia. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're right, Carrie Joe. Sam has an awesome video. Um, well, uh, oh, we already popped it into the chat. Good job, Kurt or Dane. I'm not sure who put that in, but thank you. Yes, cool, cool. Sorry, I'm just reading the comments here really quick. 
While you look, Andrew, I'm just going to make that point that for any of you wanting the exercises that Andrew's referring to that's in the chat, just go to our YouTube channel in the search engine. Just type in exercises and they'll pop up for you, not just from Sam, but also from Andrew. Cool. Thanks, KG. Appreciate that. <laughs> Tony, yes, Netflix and swivels. Maybe even a glass of wine or something. Well, of course, if you're of age, yes. <laughs> But that's really what, what we want you to practice is really just getting that dexterity down so that you can really cut in just so many different positions without putting stress on the wrist. This is something that you really want to just kind of keep as neutral as possible. And the way you check in on that is just simply, see if I get far enough back, just shake out your arms and just let your hands fall naturally and then just bend your elbows. You'll see what natural wrist position looks like. So if that's my natural wrist position, I want to keep my hands as close to that as I possibly can. I can rotate, that's fine, but I don't want to do this. That's when we start to put stress on the, on the um, carpal tunnel area. Cool. Um, what, <laughs> wine is nice too, yes, Tony. <laughs> okay, so um, just to kind of step all the way back, First thing, for, first things first, as soon as you get to the salon, ground your feet back onto the floor. Double check, make sure those feet are flat on the floor. And just keep checking in with this. Maybe it's even putting up a little post-it note somewhere that you see pretty often to check in with body position because it's so easy. Once we start to get back into our routine, you your body's natural tendency is to go back to what's just very, very comfortable. So if you've already built some bad habits, it's going to be the natural state of your body to go back to those bad habits when you're not consciously deciding to form a new habit. So you have to have some kind of reminder to keep checking back in, but just keep checking back into the feet because they're going to tell you what you need to know. Once you get the feet nice and anchored, just kind of continue to keep that balance up through the whole body. Then just really pay attention to what's happening through these elbows and shoulders. Depending on where you're at at the head, it might mean that you're palm to palm, might mean backhand to palm, might be more natural sometimes in cutting position. So what I mean by that is this is palm to palm cutting where the, both palms are facing each other. Sometimes it's more natural to get into backhand to palm. That's okay too. Or it might be overhand where you're cutting on the outside of the fingers, right? And it just really de depends on um, where you're at within the head. Mary, you're asking about shoes, flat shoes. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is a tough one because I know a lot of you guys want to wear those beautiful high heels and stuff. And then, you know, you feel beautiful in your high heels. God bless you. Like high heels are awesome. The challenge is, is that they are putting your feet into a position that is so unnatural. It's putting so much pressure forward that it's going to lean you forward into the into the um, pads of your feet. Now, you know, I know that they make more comfortable heels and stuff like that. I'm definitely not an expert on that, but maybe you can find some kind of compromise with a subtle heel to it. But the more that we can, again, kind of keep those feet in a natural, neutral position on the floor, it, it's just going to be healthier for your body. Yeah. Yeah. So MJ, you're talking about arch support. Yeah. The, a little bit of arch support is always great. Yeah. Lupe Dan, Danner actually has kind of like a, a work wear kind of line. That's awesome. Hi, Rosie. Welcome in from Jersey. It's good to see you on here again. Yeah, Dory, it's going to take some practice to break those habits for sure. Dansko, yeah, that's a great line of, of uh, good, healthy shoes for people that are on their feet all the time. Um, my physical therapist and yoga teacher, he, he kind of teaches me that something that doesn't have too much sculpting in it is actually good, too, if you're taking good care of your feet. I guess... The need for arch supports, the need for all that sculpting has kind of come from us not taking great care of our feet, but so take care of your feet too. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, talked about shoulders, wrists, elbows, all those things. Remember to practice your exercises. Get that still thumb, get a nice range of motion with your shears and not bending the wrist. And that's gonna help you guys to have a much, much better, longer career behind the chair. Something that you're not gonna be complaining about, all the uh, um, pains and all that. I did forget there was one other thing I wanted to talk to you about and it popped into my head because we did talk about neck and it's stools. So we actually have a custom stool. I actually don't have one in my office to show you, <laughs> but they're quite nice because they're very sculpted. They have a backrest to them. They, uh, they're made for us by our friends at Minerva. So mm, really fantastic stools. When I first started to do hair, Stools were very taboo because they, it, um, people would say that it makes you lazy with your body positioning. What makes you lazy with your body positioning is getting lazy. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're standing or sitting. So um, there are definitely times, especially we were talking about the opportunity where you might have a guest stand up to do the perimeter so that you can get in a better body position. Other option is to get your butt down. I always liked having a stool in the salon because I liked the variance throughout my day of sitting, standing, sitting, standing, sitting, standing. And having those different positions to be in throughout the day is actually quite good for you. So don't be afraid to, to work with a stool too. Yeah, Gary Jo said that she started with one. <clears throat> Simone's suggesting La Vita, a French brand for shoes. Hi, Gina from Dubai. Malu from London. Cool. So as always, know that we are here as a resource for you. So if you have additional questions, if you need some support on how to work with, uh, with, with your body to have a nice long career at the chair, we are here for you to help you out. Um, this will be live on our Facebook and YouTube channel forever. So if there's anything that you missed, I know you just joined us, Rosie, and I'm sure you'd love to jump back in and check stuff out. This will stay on our Facebook and YouTube channel or just need to come back and do a review of the hand exercises. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I just noticed. Uh... Oh, Becky was mentioning shoulders hurt most after men's cuts. Probably, Becky, yeah, if uh, you don't have a lot of height, this might be a good opportunity to try and get them lower so that you're not up here as you're working. Really common challenge. Antonio, yeah, with the stool. Very cool. All right, so that's what I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed that. I know it wasn't some fancy smancy haircut, but this is so incredibly important. If we want to have a long, healthy, profitable career, and we don't want to come back from the salon every night going, oh, my shoulder, oh, my neck, oh, my you know, whole body, then these are the things we have to pay attention to. So with that, Kurt, will you bring up the uh, schedule one more time for the education? I just want to remind them what we have going on this week. So tomorrow, October 6th, join us for Tuesday. It's actually not with Sammy. I'll be here with you guys. But we have Amanda Ziegelman joining us. She is just a super rock and roll hairdresser. She's going to be talking about those cool, like kind of mullety, shaggy looks that we're seeing, how to create it with different tools, making sure we get that awesome texture in the hair, kind of talking about some of the history of rock and roll hair. It's going to be a really fun one. Join us Wednesday. Even if you are not a salon owner, we are leaders in our own right. So Steve Gomez is joining me. He's an amazing business coach, good friend of ours for a long time. He's going to be talking about certain leadership in uncertain times, because that's what we need, guys. We need some great leadership. And if you're Part of our partner school program, we have our Skills Up student training coming up this Thursday. Again, this is something that is exclusive to our partners. We sometimes can get some sneak peeks for those of you that are working within the, the school world. You can contact Kurt at samvia.com to see if you qualify to kind of get a guest pass to check that out. This one's going to be fun. Sam and I are going to go from the foundations of the Bob into common challenges. So, like I said, if you're in the school world, reach out to Kurt. 
maybe we can get some backstage passes. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Signing off here, Andrew Carruthers, Education Director for Zambia. I'll see you tomorrow.